Bison Deal, once known as Brian Williams, left the NBA behind to explore the world. His quest carried him to a mysterious end near Tahiti. More than a decade later, his spirit sails on. It has been 11 years since the NBA player's catamaran went missing off the coast of Tahiti, and the FBI descended upon this small island in the middle of the Pacific, flanked by journalists asking questions about murder and love and fame. 11 years since the TV reenactments and the breathless tabloid reports. 11 years and the mystery remains unsolved. Many on the island have forgotten. Others prefer not to speak about what occurred. It has been so long, they say, averting their eyes. That has nothing to do with us. Tahiti relies on tourism, on its reputation as a paradise on earth. Why talk about death? Dig deeper, though, and you can find those who remember. Not just what happened, but what came before. The basketball player, says Big Charlie. Yes, I met him. Big Charlie is tall, and, like many Polynesian men, with a taste for beer, thick of belly. Three brown teeth are visible when he smiles. Charlie works on the beach at the swanky Sofitel Resort on Maria, a small island neighboring Tahiti. He shows rich honeymooners how to chop a coconut. In his younger, slimmer days, he manned the front desk at the Sofitel, and he remembers the handsome green-eyed giant who stayed in one of the overwater bungalows a decade ago. Such a kind man, says Charlie. Big heart. Was here three weeks? And Charlie never even knew he was famous. And his girlfriend? Wow. You've never seen anyone so beautiful. Charlie remembers how the pair used to ride a little red scooter along the island's winding roads. The girl wedged between the player's legs as he steered them past hidden bays, oyster farms, lush forests, and roadside stands selling papayas and pineapples. You could feel their love, Charlie says. He stopped smiling. It was sad what happened. Charlie says he is not the man to talk to, though. There is someone else. His name is Tiva. He lives on the far west side of the island, out past the mile markers, and has no cell phone. But ask anyone in Haapiti, and they will know him. Tava was with the basketball player and his girlfriend every day, for nearly a month, just before the end. He was their last friend. If you are looking for answers, Charlie says, maybe Teva has them. Answers? Those depend on which questions you ask. In 1998, he changed his name to honor his Cherokee heritage and, after eight seasons in the NBA, walked away from the last five years and $36 million of his contract with the Pistons. It is June 13th, 1997, and the United Center in Chicago is a cauldron of joy. The Bulls have just won the NBA championship, their fifth in seven years, in an epic series against the Utah Jazz that included two last-second game winners and a remarkable flu-ridden performance in Game 5 by Michael Jordan. Now the team gathers on a portable stage erected on the parquet. Red and white confetti drifts down and 24,000 Chicago fans roar. In the midst of it, all is Jordan, hugging his finals MVP trophy and grinning, a flake of red tinsel stuck to his right temple. To his left is coach Phil Jackson, bushy-haired and bearded, and next to him, Scotty Pippen. Not far back is Dennis Rodman, scalp the color of a child's finger painting, and Steve Kerr, holding his son on his shoulders. But the player closest to Jordan, the one standing just to his right, is Brian Williams, the Bulls' 6'10 forward center. The two men had become friends after the Bulls signed Williams as a free agent that April. Jordan pushed him to get in shape, 
to maximize his talent, to truly care about the game. Williams responded. He played a key role in the Bulls' championship run, logging nearly as many minutes as starting center Luke Longley. Kerr says the team wouldn't have won the series without Williams. A childhood track standout who didn't try organized basketball until the 10th grade, the left-handed Williams played with uncommon grace on the court. He glided and swooped through the game. He was an excellent outlet passer and trailer on the break, if at times an apathetic player. He'd been a McDonald's All-American at St. Monica Catholic High near Los Angeles and an honorable mention All-America at Arizona before being drafted by the Orlando Magic with the 10th pick in 1991. A season before joining the Bulls, he averaged 15.8 points and 7.6 rebounds for the Clippers. Still, he'd never experienced anything like this moment in the United Center. Which is what makes it so interesting in hindsight. Pull up the NBC footage and you can see the 28-year-old Williams on the stage behind Jordan, those pale green eyes staring over MJ's shoulder as the Bulls celebrate. This was Williams' first title, but you wouldn't know it. During what should have been the highlight of his professional career, he looked distant, unsmiling, almost disembodied. Friends recalled that look two years later, when after Williams changed his name to Bison Dell to honor his Cherokee and African heritage, he walked away from the remaining five years and $36.45 million of his contract with the Pistons. No one could believe it. Who walks away from $36 million? Most assumed he would return. He never did. Instead, drawing on close to $16 million in career earnings, he traveled to the remote corners of the world, exploring the Australian outback and sailing the South Pacific. His quest eventually took him to French Polynesia and to a woman named Serena, but it also attracted others to him. That's the thing about escaping from some place or someone. No matter how far you go, you can't leave everything behind. To understand why Dila ended up in Tahiti, you must first understand who he was. And few knew him better, Patrick Byrne. They made an odd pair. Byrne, the white, shaggy-haired son of a Geico insurance magnate, and Dile, the towering son of a soul singer. They met in 1991 through a mutual friend, Ahmad El Hosseini, the son of a former head of the Lebanese parliament. It was two months before Byrne learned his new friend, then still known as Brian Williams, was an NBA player. Theirs was a friendship based on inhaling life. When Byrne was 21, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer. In remission, after three years of treatment, he vowed to never waste a moment. He biked across the U.S. solo, trained in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, earned a black belt in taekwondo, and got a Ph.D. in philosophy from Stanford. In Williams, he found a kindred soul. Williams had overcome a rough childhood to embrace all the world had to offer. In 1989, he journeyed to Beirut during Lebanon's civil war, ignoring a State Department ban. He ran with the Bulls in Pamplona, attended art gallery openings, and played the saxophone, violin, and trumpet. He loved Wynton Marsalis and Miles Davis. He was enamored of William Blake's poetry and the films of Jim Jarmusch. He and Byrne spent long nights debating politics, race, and philosophy. Williams was particularly fond of Friedrich Nietzsche. He read Beyond Good and Evil many times, and was heavily influenced by Thus Spake Zarathustra, Nietzsche's philosophical novel about self-mastery and self-enhancement. For the first couple of months after the boat's disappearance, there was only confusion. Friends and relatives waited to hear something, anything. In late August, 
the U.S. Coast Guard sent a telex distress bulletin to all ships within a 1000 mile radius of Tahiti. Scott Olgren, Serena's stepfather, put together a detailed 24-page summary of events and tried to contact the FBI and the White House for help. Gail Rosewood, Serena's mother, held out hope. Then, on September 5th, the first clue. At 1.30 that afternoon, in Phoenix, a man claiming to be Bison Dealey, a man who looked a lot like Bison Dealey and possessed his passport and checkbook, attempted to purchase 461-ounce Gold Eagle coins from Certified Mint, Inc., a gold dealer on North Central Ave. The total cost, written in small, neat numbers on a First Union check, $152,096. Two months after the disappearance of the Hukuna Matata, Kevin Williams was apprehended by the Phoenix police after he used his brother's passport and checkbook in an attempt to buy 460 gold coins. The bank notified Kevin Porter, deal's assistant, of the check, and Porter contacted Certified Mint, and then the Phoenix Police Department, which in turn apprehended Miles DeBoard, a.k.a. Kevin Williams. Porter flew in from Detroit. Five hours of questioning followed. Under interrogation, Daybird claimed he was buying the gold on behalf of his brother, who was okay the last time he saw him. Since Dell couldn't be reached to disprove this, the Phoenix PD allowed Daybird to leave. It was, the FBI would later say, a crucial mistake. Phoenix is a world away from French Polynesia, but eventually, the sequence of events leading up to Daybird's arrival in Phoenix would become clear. How a man matching the description of Miles DeBoard was spotted on July 8th at the Pearl Resort on Maria where he stayed for the better part of a week with his girlfriend, who had flown in to meet him from Los Angeles. The couple ate well and sat by the pool. Then, on July 16th, a slightly damaged catamaran, registered as the Aria Bella, with the vinyl letters that had spelled Hukuna Matata removed from its stern, was piloted into Feton Bay on Tahiti's southeastern shore by a man fitting DeBoard's description. DeBoard stored the boat and left on a flight to Los Angeles, after which he flew to Belize before arriving in Arizona. Now, after being held overnight and released in Phoenix, DeBoard ran, first to Palo Alto, to his girlfriend's place, and then to the border. Here is what Tiva believes. He believes that DeBoard intended to kill his brother in order to steal away Serena. Tiva saw the way the man he knew as Miles looked at Serena. Only something backfired. When Miles fired the gun that day on the boat, Serena leapt in front of Brian, taking the bullet. Tiva is sure of it. It is heartbreaking. It is romantic. When Miles fired the gun that day on the boat, Serena leapt in front of Brian, taking the bullet. Tiva is sure of it. It is heartbreaking. It is romantic. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and comment down any topics you would like to be covered.